you have a limited number of Fs to give. You do. Okay. And so the way that I look at it is just it's like, I, like, I think we should be hyper committed to giving our Fs to things that are in our control, things that you can touch, manage, influence, and control. Like, can I influence this? Can I manage it? Can I touch it? Is there a sense of control in it? If the answer is yes, you get my energy. That thing gets my energy. That person gets my energy. That task gets my energy. That performance gets my energy. If the answer is no, for the most part, right? There's like some, I get it, There's like certain situations, but for the most part, the answer is no, you don't get that. Like you don't get that precious resource and commodity. The answer is no. Hello, welcome to Something for Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashvitz. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Aaron. Excited to be here and excited to chat with you. Me too. I absolutely am pumped to have this conversation with you. And before we get into the meat and bones of what I want to talk to you about, I have one very important question. The most important question I'll ask you this whole episode. And hopefully you feel like you want to answer it honestly. So, Brian, how are you doing? Like, really, how are you doing? I am tired and uh, I, I I'm in a uh, I'm in the in the odd space right now um, for those that work at professional baseball. It's because we are about a week and a half out from spring training. Um, and, you know, I just spent about three months ish off with my family. And it's like the ultimate like you are a dad. You're just dad zone, family zone. It's like all you do. It's all you breathe. It's all you think about. Um, and I think you just get really used to it and really excited about it and you love it. And then there's also this super exciting of like baseball is coming back, but you, you sort of have in the back of your mind, like, you know, that you're, you know, I'll be gone from my family for about five weeks. Um, and then I'll see them for a little bit and then be gone again. But it's like, you know, you, you start to realize like, oh, you're gonna miss them. So I'm, I'm a little bit in this like uh, limbo zone where I'm like trying to be super present and be with my family um, and be around everybody and just spend time with them. Um, but also like thinking about baseball. So uh, I would say that there's that. I'm also just tired because I have a one and a half year old and a three and a half year old. So uh, all the parents out there that got kids that age, you, you know, the kind of tired I'm talking about. But uh, I am I'm excited to be here. I, I just, you know, again, really appreciate the opportunity to get to talk about this uh, this high performance life. Yes. Before we actually get into these some high performance traits, we we briefly touched on this before I hit record. But what has learning about high performance, being around all these elite athletes, taught you, or even slightly prepared you for being a dad? Um, man, it's uh, I think the unpredictability of it all, right, is like, um. I think that the best performers are able to perform when they need to, right? It's like their attention is where it needs to be when it matters most. Their focus is where it needs to be when it matters most. Um, They're able to like regulate their emotions and their physiology when it matters most. Uh, I think there's parts of that uh, about being a dad. Um, It's there's, there's moments, you know, you and I talked briefly before we hit record, there's, there's moments where it's just like you are so frustrated or you're so tired because your kids are up early or you're just like, or they're not listening or they just don't understand. And, uh, and you experience like emotions and physiology, like, like that, the responses that you have from it. Um, and you, and you have to be able to sort of like really take a step back and slow down and like reflect and be more aware in that moment. And I think that's what you see in high performance is like, they don't leave it up to chance. They like, instead of like just letting the whole at bat get out of hand or the whole game get out of hand, they maybe like lose it for one pitch. Right. And then allows them to re-engage. And I think that's the part I've been trying to be as a dad is like when there's some of those frustrations, those moments, like really reflecting and taking a step back, you know, reminding yourself that it's a one and a half and a three and a half year old, (laughs) right? Like they're just, they they don't have self-regulation, self-control. Like they don't have that. And so um, it, and I'll be honest with you, like talk about perspective. It, it, just makes me realize like my wife, I mean, she's, she stays at home with our kids during the season. She's going to stay at home while I'm at spring training for this long period of time. And, um, it puts into perspective for me, just like how absolutely incredible she is and like how patient she is and thoughtful she is and deliberate she is with the kids. Um, it just, yeah, it just makes me, um, I'm just, I'm just infatuated with her both as, as my wife and as a mother. And it's just, I think that's like something that I just, uh, I really look up to her for. Yeah, every single mother 
deserves way more credit than they've ever given gotten credit for. Um, Absolutely. Especially as, as I've gotten older, right. I just like uh, the less I need my mom, the more I love her and what she did for me when I absolutely did need her for everything. Uh, yeah. And so it's so cool. And then to realize that as a, as a parent now too, with your wife is like, seems really cool. I'm excited for that journey when it gets there for me. Yeah, it's it's uh it's something special, man. So I'm I'm so happy that I have a partner to do this with uh, the way that we get to do it. And you know, again, I just uh it, it's a very cool and and it's a crazy cool life um in the world of professional baseball. It's chaotic, the travel, um, all the things. But to be able to share it with my family is super cool too. You know, just uh my kids are getting the kids are getting a little older. You know, they come to the ballpark, they kind of do fun things on like the day games and stuff, and that's that's the part that makes it really worth it. So yeah, man, enjoying it. It's magical. So I want to break down this post that you made. Um, your 2022, I know it's 2023, but bear with me. <laughs> High performance traits. And there's eight of them. Uh, I'm going to go name each one and then hopefully get your feedback and your insight and, and go from there. Sound good? Yeah, sounds great. Just uh, I'll, I'll provide some context for those that maybe haven't like read full the post or anything like that. So just for clarity, we, you know, at spring training, we're there for like 55 days straight, sometimes 60 days, just every day, no days off, just grinding through it. Right. And it's like, everybody's at the complex. So you got all your minor league players, all your major league players, all your minor league staff, major league staff, every front office person, trainer, strength coach, dietitian, you name it, scout, they all come in, they're all there. Um, and, and we have a mental performance office. And so, uh, I'm, I'm going to, you know, shout out my, my teammates, Sean last year, and then we got a new teammate, Kevin this year. Um, but we, uh, we, you know, we big coffee drinkers. So we, we, we have something we call coffee club where we just like, we make like multiple French presses, like all these different kinds of coffees in there. And so when people walk by, you know, they smell it and they're like, Oh, that smells unbelievable. So the rule is though, is that if you're going to come into the office and have some coffee, or even if you're just going to come in and chill or catch up or, you know, we have a bunch of Rubik's cubes and things in there. It's like, if you come in, you, you got to sit down and tell us what you think the most important high performance trait is. Mm. And so we did this in 2021 and then we did it in tw obviously 2022. And, you know, so, and, and what we ended up doing is like, is like condensing them because some of them overlap and stuff. But at one point our whole whiteboard is filled up and then we, we sort of condense them down into like what this final grouping is here. And, and so, you know, these traits are, they come from our players, our staff, front office folks like sport, you know, sports science, you name it. Um, but this is like the sort of culmination of it. And it's, uh, it's a super cool way just to, to see how different individuals view high performance and what the most important performance traits are. Um, and it also is like a perfect example of just how important coffee is in professional sports too. So just, you know, <laughs> it's, the, it's the ultimate uh, bringer together. So we got it, you know, but that that's a bit of the context of where it all came from. That's that's going to be my biggest takeaway from this episode is that we're both on the same page about coffee. Yeah, yeah, we uh, we could probably do a whole podcast on coffee, so we'll get there at some point. But yeah, we got yeah, it. yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so here we go. Um, number one is being real about my results. Yeah, so I just I think um, a lot of times like there are folks that it's not for, I I think that individuals will oftentimes um not be very authentic and real about the results that happen for a plethora of reasons right like so there, there's the ego coming into play and trying to like to save our ego or save face or whatever it might be um there's just like external blame and not wanting to take responsibility and this and that there's also just potential fear of like what you might discover as you are more real about your results um and so for for us like i think as we look at this idea it's it's really about um how can you identify what the performance was? Can you identify it as, as a performance, right? So not as you, as the performer, right? So it's like, you know, again, it's like baseball is what you do. It's not who you are. So like, can you, can you separate that? And can you identify the things that you did well? Can you identify the things that you didn't do well? And then what is, what are you going to do in the next 24 hours? So for us, it's like, it's like one up, one down, one forward, right? Like, so it's like, what's one up, one good thing that I did? What's one down, one thing that I can get better at and one forward? What's one thing I'm going to do in 24 hours to get myself better? And uh, I think that as you start to become more real about your results, those are the things you look for. And then I think the cool thing is too, is as you become more excited about it, right? And like, I'm using that word very like intentionally, you become excited about being like very honest with yourself. 
um, you recognize that that's a pathway to get better. It's, it's, it's when you're, it's when you are fearful or you are scared of being truthful about what the results are, that there's like this tension there that people just don't want to lean into and they don't. And then it just inhibits them from ever really reaching their potential. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Most, most people have a really like even outside of elite sport, right? Most people have a very tough time with being honest about themselves. And I think a lot of it boils down to, because their starting point seems like super embarrassing only to them, right? I haven't cleaned my room in four years. So my starting point is like, I have to put like this one sock in the drawer is like all I can do. And I'm not going to be honest about that because that's embarrassing, technically speaking, mm -hmm. right? But whatever it is, it doesn't matter. That's your starting point. And that's the only way that you can make a one tiny step forward is absolutely getting to the root of that honesty and being like, this is my absolute starting point. And if all it is, is doing like one push up once a week, that's my exercise routine. Great. That's what it is for me, you know? And it's like making those little habits too small to fail. And then I think as you, as you get momentum going, then you start to get some of these bonus reps in, you know, speaking for like people who are outside of elite sport, but it's really hard for, for anyone really to be honest about their results. And I think, yeah, it falls in line with exactly what you said uh, about some of those things. But I think um, a little like personal shame, potentially personal embarrassment goes into play with that because you're like, oh, yeah. oh, like, what, what am I like? I can't even do this one thing. Well, you can do this one thing. You just have to be honest enough to start at that point and say, OK, this is my starting point. Now it's only up from here. I mean, we play the compare game too. Like, let's not let's not pretend, right? Like, what social media provides for us, mm -hmm. everyone sees, everyone sees what they believe is the finalized product. But like, social media is not real. It's not real. They choose what to show you. Like, mm -hmm. it's just not real. And I think that like, that's always the hard part too. Is that we we always want to be at the level of somebody else or want to be. And it's like, I will say, I mean, I'm just as guilty in the comparing game. It's like. Um, because I'm friends with a lot of like really badass mental performance practitioners. And I think to myself, like, damn, dude, I would love to be, you know, whatever, fill in the blank, whether it's like Justin Sua or Lauren Johnson, whatever it's like. And, and there's times where like, I, I sometimes will say that to myself and then I'm just like, dude, you're at a totally different point in your life. Like, and be where your feet, are. like, just be stoked about where you are. Right. And I think that, uh, like even like young practitioners or young people or people just starting stuff, it's like, to know that those people that you envy or excited about or that you love or you watch, they all started there. Every single person did. And I think like when you start to have that perspective, again, it comes, comes back to perspective, like that I think can be very helpful too. Um, but just, you know, don't forget that like social media is just the highlight real people. Don't, you know, let it, let it be for what it is. Absolutely. <clears throat> all right. Number two, non-situational sense of self. This was an interesting one. I'm not going to lie. Um, uh, this was, this was a player who who came in and, and, uh, and talked through this with us a little bit. And um, again, like I, I, like I can only interpret based off of our conversation. I certainly have some thoughts on it too, but I think um, this ties a little bit into as well, a little bit of like, uh, like baseball is what you do, not who you are. So it's like in those moments of high performance, right. Can you like, look at yourself and and just say like this is what i'm going to try to accomplish regardless of the situation mm -hmm. and it's like you have an idea of who you are and the performer that you can be and the environmental or situational components that that happen should not influence what you're able to do so i think there's a tie in a little bit to pressure here tie in a little bit to the environment and i I was actually talking about this with a coworker today. Um, so we were talking about, about the idea of pressure. And I said, the cool thing about baseball, at least that I, I, I like about it is like, um, you know, for a lot of other sports or whatever it might be, um, there's, there's like, I, I don't think there's like as many so-called like pressure situations, but I'm, I, I was telling her that like, you know, in every baseball game, right. There's like, and not, not, I mean, everyone, but you know what I mean? Like in most baseball games, there, there is the bases loaded moment, right? Mm -hmm. Three, two count. There is the, the bottom of the ninth inning there is. And again, we play 162 games in 180 days. It's crazy. But like, there's just so many opportunities for that to come up. And I think that 
the individuals that can truly be and understand who they are as a performer and not let that sort of situation control or influence who they are, what they do in that moment. That I think is what we mean by a non-situational sense of self is like, I know who I am. I am this person when I am performing, regardless of the situation. Mm -hmm. And again, that's really hard. But I also believe that um, the more that we understand ourselves, um, the better opportunities we have to do that. Um, it's not easy. It's, it's, let's not pretend, right? It's not easy. It's a lot easier in the practice round than it is in the big game where everyone's watching you because there's additional factors that our physiology plays out. But um, I think that's a little bit of what that looks like and what we're talking about there. Yeah. Because when I when I read that one, I didn't quite understand it. And I'm trying to track you a little bit. So <clears throat> for you, when you're training your players, are you trying to have them view like game, let's say 17, the same way they view facing the New York Yankees in the major league playoffs? Like, are you saying it like that, where it's like, it's still just a baseball game? Yes, the stakes may be higher. Yes, if there's more people potentially watching on TV. Yes, the pressure may seem the same, but it's still a baseball game, the one you've been playing your entire life. Is that is that sort of what you're getting at? I mean, yeah, so that that's certainly part of what we're getting at. I I mean, I also I also am a big fan of just like saying the unsaid thing, right? So like for a lot of our guys that make their major league debuts, like when they're pitchers, like a lot of them have said that they like can't feel their legs when they're on the mound. <laughs> like they're like, I just can't feel them, right? That's like a physiological response to an experience that you're going. And it's like, you know, even even for players that have been in, been on the team for a while and it's their first playoff experience, that experience is different because of the physiology that you will experience right like the stadiums are louder the fans are meaner right whatever it is right like the stakes are so-called higher so i think part of it is like is that we need to understand that and so i i certainly come from like a more of an understanding model versus a deficit model in terms of high performance so it's like you know the deficit model is just like hey you're the jacked up player hey you're struggling or hey you can't do this so go talk to the mental performance guy or go talk to the sports psych or whatever it might be the way that I look at it is like an understanding model. So, hey, the more that we understand how the brain impacts the body, the brain body connection, the biology brain connection, the more that we understand that, the less scary these responses that we get in our bodies are. And the reason that they're less scary is because we understand them, right? It's not about stopping them, right? It's not about stopping feeling nervous. It's not about stopping the idea that you can't feel your legs or that you might be a little bit shaky or that you dry heat before a game. It's not about stopping that stuff. It's about understanding why all of those things happen. And what's crazy and awesome is that those biological responses, those physiological responses, they happen for a specific reason. That reason is that our body and our brain is priming us to kick ass. And we start to understand what all those processes are. And again, like if you're talking to a player, you can explain to them about why we dry heave, right? Or why we feel like we have to go to the bathroom before we're going to play or why we shake before we're going to do something really important. There's, there's reasons for that. And it's, you know, and I think that that's the exciting part is that the more we understand that, um, the, the less, the less scary it becomes because now we know why those things are happening because we understand why our biology is doing that. Mm -hmm. So less that something is wrong with you, more that something is happening, we can understand it and then approach it best that way to best suit your needs for the situation you're about to encounter. Yeah. I mean, that's why I like, I mean, I know I was just talking trash about in like uh, social media, but also like social media is super cool because you you can actually get very, very cool, awesome um, information from experts that you might not ever get a chance to talk to or, or see or experience. And YouTube is great for all this too, but it's like, you know, I, I feel like a lot of um, the the normal general population is starting to hear and understand a bit more about like the brain body connection and about um, about how the brain directly influences our body. Um, and that's that's really exciting. And I think that's what a lot of mental performance is. And in, in, in the coaching that we do is helping players understand and physiologically what's happening to them because it's, it's driven by the mind. Right. Yeah, I mean, for such a long time, when you heard like therapist, counselor, psychologist, it was like, oh, something's like, like you're you're not right, like something's off. And that might be true, right? Something might be off, but it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. It doesn't mean you're broken. And now we're getting to the point where people are just going to folks like you or a psychologist or a therapist or a counselor, or whatever, the, to just to just try to become the best version of themselves. 
because they've gotten to a certain level on their own. They're like, okay, maybe I'll get a coach. Maybe it'll help me check out my blind spots or tweak this or tweak that or whatever the case may be is. And that's really cool to see it come from where it used to be to like, ooh, like I'll just say that I'm, I have a personal trainer and not that I'm going to my therapist because I don't want people to think that I'm like this weirdo and, you know, all that horrible stigma that surrounded it for a really long time. And now like sport has taken over with this sort of stuff and like integrated into business and all these sorts of cool things and into regular population where we're gaining this knowledge. And it's like, yeah, you're just trying to be the best you. And that's about thinking about the whole system as a whole, not as two separate parts and then diving in from there to try to understand yourself the best and, and relating back to number one was starting with some honesty about where you're at and then going from there. Couldn't have said it any better. Wow, you're spot on. Love that. Oh, uh, yeah, cool. Sweet. <laughs> so number three, <laughs> um, this might be my favorite one, but we'll see. I might say that more than once. <laughs> uh, so number three, consistent results come from consistent behaviors. I mean, that you were, I mean, you kind of talked about it, but um, in, in I think in the first one about the about just like, I mean, you I, forget, I believe you were saying like like little small behaviors that you can't fail at. I mean, I look at it as just like micro habits of just like what we do day in and day out. But it's, I mean, it's the truth. It's see, it's the idea though is like, it's it's being okay with the boredom. That's mm. that's where people that I I genuinely believe that is where a lot of people trip up is that they can't handle the mundane boringness of excellence. Mm. And I truly believe that to be excellent, you have to be phenomenal at the mundane, boring tasks day in and day out. And it's, um, I see it in baseball because it is every day. They play every single day. And it's like, man, we, you know, whatever. We just went to extra innings the night before. We got done, you know, like at like 11.45 at night probably don't get on the bus to head back to the hotel until like 1245, maybe go to bed at like one 30. Right. And you're like exhausted. And then you wake up the next morning, whatever. If like, if you're just a player, maybe you sleep in a little bit later. I try to wake up, whatever, grab a coffee, do that thing. But then the players, they get there like one o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And then, and then they do it all over again. They, they do all of their physical stuff, all the mobility, all of the stuff in the training room, all the gym stuff, they go out. And then like, again, we're the weird sport. We practice, we practice every day before a game. We go out and we do infield, we do outfield work. We do, we, we hit in the cage, we hit on the field, we shag BP. Like who does that? You know what I mean? All of our pitchers go out and throw. It's like, and then they go and play the game. And it's just like every single day. All, and it's like, yeah, I mean, oh man, I just, I would love to, I would love to skip my lift today. I'm just, I'm tired. I just don't feel like doing it. Right. And it's like the best don't do that. They, they know that that consistency, that's, that's what breeds the result that they want. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. Baseball is a, uh, it's such an unbelievable sport. I played baseball in college and it's one, it's my favorite sport. Uh, that's why I also, I was really excited to talk to you, but it's like you do, you have a, a basically a full practice before every single game and you're not doing anything special at these practices you are taking fungo which is basically learning how to take a field the ground ball over and over and over again with guys who have like 998 fielding percentage haven't made an error in like 180 chances you know yeah guys who are hitting 330 in the league like dropping 30 bombs uh pitchers who have like crazy walk to strikeout ratios they're still working on their mechanics they're doing stuff with their towel they're getting their hips loose like they're talking to the pitching guy, like what can I do better at every single day over and over and over again. And a lot of times, as you absolutely know, when they get to the yard, they're like, all right, I'm not feeling it today, but this is what I do. This is who I am. This is how I've created myself. And I've, I've mastered the art of showing up and I'm going to keep showing up. And it's beautiful because when you think about that same approach to like a, just a regular human being, it's like your fundamentals are like, eating well, moving well, sleeping well, mm -hmm. and thinking well. That's every day. And you can add some other stuff into those four things. But if you master those four things, I mean, I, I would say you're probably flourishing at a really high level. Yeah. I mean, again, it's, uh, and I, I do, as I like, as you like zoom out from the professional world and you think about like you as a, just like a, 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 a normal human being, right? It's like, what, like, what are you doing every single day? And it's like, even on the days that you don't want to, and it's still right. It's those days that you're tired or the days that you're just like, whatever you had the extra meeting or your kids were up a little bit extra late, what, but it's like, 
but you know that like that movement or that 20 minute Peloton ride or that 15 minutes of stretching in the morning, like you don't like, so it might not impact you that day, but it's like the secondary tertiary effects. Right. Cause it, like, and you know, I, I know you like you skip one day and then you just like, right. So like, you're like, oh, it's okay. Right. We, this is like one of my friends. It's again, we, we negotiate with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, I'm like, I like, I, you know, I'm like, I, I just, I choose not to negotiate with myself because the negotiate for me, the negotiator always wins. Right. So I just, I, I personally just choose not to negotiate with myself. Mm -hmm. It's just not, but like, you know, oh, we, I said I would do this for an hour. I'll, I'll just, I've already done it for 45 minutes. It's fine. I'll just jump off. Right. And it's like, are you going to, is that, is that the negotiation? You're going to cut corners in, in every part of your life. Right. Like, oh, I told my daughter I'd read her two books tonight, but I'm just going to read her one. It's fine. It's fine. It's okay. But it's not. It's like, and, and so it's just what you say you're going to do, you do. And it's like mm -hmm. that. It's just like this finite thing. It's just like, what you, what you say you're going to do, you do. And I, I think like, um, it's, I, and listen, I know it's not as black and white as that, but that's, that's the way that I've, I've really constructed it for at least me personally, mentally, like that's, that's the way that it's going to look. And I think that some of the highest performers are, are similar in, in that sense. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I think that's how you, that's how you earn trust and confidence within yourself. Mm -hmm. And so when things ultimately don't go the way you want them to, you have, you have a foundation to fall back on so you can keep showing up the next day and hopefully it goes better. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's spot on. I love that. <clears throat> Number four, emotions come and go, accept them and choose to do with them what you want. So this was actually, um, maybe I can, maybe we can link the video to it, but this mm -hmm. was, this came from a, a Kobe Bryant talk. Um, he, Kobe was on a podcast. Uh, I can't remember what it was, but it's, it's a longer phrase in this, but um, it's, it's just, it's just pretty fascinating. I mean, it's just, I love hearing Kobe talk and his mentality. Um, but he really dove into this idea that just like, basically people get very caught up in the emotions that they feel. And I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think people are a lot of people are controlled by their emotions and they make decisions off of their emotions. And listen, it's no fault of their own either, because like, the uh like we are we are very in tune as human beings to our emotions and to our physiology right it's like it's like the two things that we're, like we're very in touch with right like um but what's funny is that like when you ask hey like what drives all of that nobody sits and says well it's our thoughts right but it, like but it is the cadence is our thoughts drive our emotions our emotions drive our physiology our physiology impacts our performance so it's thoughts emotions physiology and and so I, you know i can't if I ask you like, Hey, like Aaron, what, what were you thinking about yesterday morning at 9.00 AM? You know, you, you can't, you can't tell me, but if I'm like, Hey, how did you feel in like your best baseball game that you ever played in? Mm. You know, you know, you could boom, right, right there. Right. Like right in that moment. Yeah. I, and I, and what's funny is like your brain just went there, right. You just went right. there. You just felt something physiologically. You just felt some emotions, right. Just comes right back. And so we experience these emotions in a very strong way. And, and when, when Kobe talks about this, he just says like, the emotions are there. Yes, they come and they go. And, and, and he almost looks at it from like a bit of like a, of like a mindfulness perspective, right? Like they are there without, like, I'm there with these emotions without judgment. They are just there. And I'm going to choose what to do or what not to do with them. Right. And like Andy Pettacombe, when he, he's, uh, he's the, the creator of Headspace. Um, and he like, he does the analogy of mindfulness where he's like, you're just sitting on the side of the road and you're just watching these cars go by. And it's like, that's what they are. Like, you're just watching the cars and they go by and you might recognize that like you get very focused on one car. Right. And you just like are following it. He's like, that's okay. Like you don't have to judge yourself for that. Just choose to not look at that car anymore and just continue to watch the traffic and the cars go by. And it's like, that's what our emotions are. And I think that the, the, the more consistent we can be with just having that sort of perspective. And then, and then we get to choose what we do with them. Right. And you, you, you get to make that choice versus letting the emotion decide what, what you do or what to do to you. And I think that, that, that makes a huge difference um, as we, as we start to understand sort of what's going on. I also think it's really important for people to know that like you experience the emotions, like they're, they're very strong because like, because we don't remember our thoughts, but know that if you want to change your emotions or you're not fond of an emotion or you're not fond of a physiological response it is your thinking your thoughts that will do that that will drive that change for you mm. is this uh high performance trait did you did you speak about like 
um, how you speak to yourself with your players when they came in to write this one down, or, or was that not part of this? Um, I think it's a, it's a little bit a part of this. Um, so I have a really hard time with the word positive and negative. And so like people sure. talk about self-talk all the time. And I just, I, I personally, this is just my opinion. Just want to make this very clear this is a disclaimer. I cringe when people are like, oh, it's gotta be positive self-talk. You gotta have that positive self-talk. You gotta have the positive, like, listen, yes. If you're like just down talking yourself consistently. Okay. Roger that. I'm more of a fan of the words effective self-talk and ineffective self-talk or productive self-talk and counterproductive self-talk versus positive and negative. Mm. Cause I know some of the best players in the world who talk so much shit to themselves, which would be considered very negative and it absolutely does what the, what the job is and, and the need for them. And so um, I do think part of it is like, what are you saying to yourself consistently, which is obviously driving your emotions and your physiology. Mm. Um, but the other part too, is that half the stuff we say to ourselves isn't even true. And, and that's a bigger problem. That's a bigger concern is that like, we oftentimes, like we don't base our thinking in reality. Um, we, we catastrophize and we, we, grab onto one little thing that that may or may not be true. And that's what we create our narrative off of. And that's incredibly dangerous as well. Um, I, I'd much rather somebody, um, you know, have some ambiguity versus like decide that this is what it is. And it's just not even close to, to being based in reality. Yes, that's, it's good that you bring that up because I, I also coach a 14 year old baseball team and one strikeout leads to I'm the worst baseball player that's ever existed on earth. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how we get there, right? That's a wild like, story we tell ourselves. Just right there. Like, yeah. and you can just see it after they strike out and they're just taking their few steps back into the dugout. And it's like, everything is come, it's come crashing down. And that's exactly what I told them. I'm like, I'm not, I, I don't, negative, positive self-talk doesn't matter. I want you to just ask yourself the things that you're saying to yourself are true and then figure out a way to say, no, they're not true. And then what can you say that might be credible in this moment? Did you swing at a bad pitch? Okay, cool. Did mm -hmm. you chase a, a ball in the dirt? Okay. Did you let strike three go down the middle? Okay, great. What can we do next time? Are you the worst baseball player who's ever existed? No, no absolutely. 100% yeah. not. And are you going to show up for your teammates right now? Or are you going to show up for yourself when you go out into the field? Like there's so many things that can happen between now and then. Yes, potentially that could have been the strikeout and the game, but we got more games to play, baby. There's more baseball that's going to happen. And so that for, for young people, I mean, I'm sure you see that sort of spiral and progression for Major League Baseball players, but it's very easy to see on a young person's face and with their body language oh, and yeah. things like that. And then, you know, trying to flip that switch on their body language as well. Like, get your chest up, get your shoulders back, like. Force yourself to be in that big pot, that big body, you know, because you're going to you're going to transverse that that stuff to your brain and then your brain might recognize that. And then you might say something that might be uplifting or credible uh, or potentially positive. Um, and so, yeah, all that stuff is, is really interesting to like see in real time. Yeah. What you just said, too, though, is like fighting the counterproductive thought in real time is really important. So like what like the, the framing that you use is, is spot on it. We use a very similar one when, when I worked for the military It's basically like what is my evidence to support this thought? I know that like, we don't, I know we don't talk, talk to ourselves like that really, but <laughs> it's, it's like kind of funny. It's kind of funny because if you do talk to yourself like that, it actually like you realize you typically don't have any evidence to support that, whatever that crappy thought is that you have. So it's just like, what's my evidence? Like if I really find myself struggling, it's like, what's my evidence to support this, right? Like I'm catastrophizing, I'm going down the rabbit hole, whatever. My boss just said that they want to talk at four o'clock, right? I'm just like going down the rabbit hole. I'm going down. It's like, oh shit, here we go. But it's, it's yeah. All right, what's my evidence to support any of this stuff? And you realize that there, there typically isn't any. So it's like, why am I going to waste my most precious resource and commodity of my energy on something that we don't even know if it's real or not? Absolutely. hundred yeah. <clears> percent. <throat> Number five, have a controllable split personality. Ah, oh, man. Some of our starting pitchers are a little, little, little wonky here. Uh, well, well, if you, if you right. understand anything about a, a baseball pitcher, then it makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. Right. It, I mean, listen, I, I've been fascinated. So like the very cool thing about our organization is that uh, a lot of our players that are in our major league team, uh, we we drafted. And so I actually knew a lot of those guys when I worked for the minor leagues, like worked in the minor leagues. And so kind of watched some of these players come up, um, you know, through the minor leagues into the big leagues. Um, and it's just so funny when you like 
when you meet some of these guys or you spend time with them off the field or in the clubhouse and you watch what they're like and, and, uh, and just like the, the, like how caring they are or like how thoughtful they are or like the music they listen, whatever it might be. And then you watch them on the field and you're just like, wow, that's almost like a different person, you know? And and, and that's not for everybody, right? It's not. But I, I think what I've realized as I tied as I tie this to mental performance, I've realized that certain guys need a certain level of energy activation to be successful. And mm-hmm. so they they sort of engage in in it's not split person now. It's that's I don't want to like, but it's it's a they have this persona or this 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 thought or these behaviors or these things that they want to to portray that my perception is puts them in a energy level that is effective for them to be at their best Mm -hmm. so the really chill guy in the clubhouse you know like again we'll just use a scale of one to ten so like they're like a you know ten's like the most jacked up person ever one's like the most lethargic ever you know in the clubhouse they're like listen to bob marley they're like a three and they're pretty chill but like if they pitched at a three they'd get whacked. And Mm -hmm. so they know that in order for them to be successful, they have to be a seven when they're pitching. And so they sort of have this different energy or this little aggression about them that seems different, right? To everyone who knows them off the field. But in reality, they're getting their energy activation exactly where they need to be to be at their best. And um, I think that that's really important for people to know um, especially performers. And again, this isn't about just sports. It's like when you go to give a, when you go to give a keynote talk or, um, when you're going to, when you're going to go coach or or whatever, or even like if you're going to take a test or something like that, right. It's like, what, how much energy do you need to be at your best as a performer? And, and what does it look like when you're overactivated, right? So if you're, if you have too much activation, what does it look like when you're underactivated? And then what does it look like when you're just right? And then mm-hmm. once you know those three things, you can have you can have tools and skills that if you're underactivated, how to sort of how to sort of ramp yourself up a little bit. And if you're overactivated, how to sort of bring yourself down to get yourself into the optimal zone. Yeah. I think what's important there is that allowing the person to be who they are when they're at their best. Cause like some people would see that as like, oh no, he's too jacked up for baseball. We gotta we got to keep him down a little bit. This is like a gentleman's sport. He can't be too fired up and do too many fist bumps and, and all that and this. And, but he's like, this is where he's at his best. And I, when he's trained that to be able to um, do that consistently, start after start after start, and it's not um, <clears throat> too like up and down, this and that, right? It's like, this is where he's at his best because he's, you know, had a different uh, amount of learning and he tried this and that and, and it worked. And through some guidance with your help, right, he's found what works for him. And then allowing him to express that, I think, is the, is the most important part. So you get different people with different personalities. And if everyone is expected to do the exact same thing all of the time, it's hard, especially when baseball is, is quite an emotional game and it's a roller coaster of a season with so many ups and downs, right? You have to have sort of these things in place that allow you to be who you are, especially for a pitcher who only you know plays every five days if you're a starter. Yeah. No, you're you're spot on. And I uh and I do think it's it's about and I think especially like as we're young, like really trying to figure out what this looks like for us, you know, and 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 doing some trial and error and 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 feeling it out. And again, it's like like and, and especially so like you 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 sometimes like might see it in your performance, right? So like even like just even for you and I talking about pitching, it's like if a guy's overactivated and he's a pitcher, right? Like like some some things that you might might see would just be like them not being able to control control the strike zone right like they're just like they're they're all over the place and it's like they're like just they're over the top and then even like if they're under activated it's just like maybe you see their velo down a little bit which is very real right and then it's like i like my favorite right is like your velo their velo is down and they're kind of they seem a little lethargic and they get a home run hit off of them and all of a sudden you see their stuff spike right and it's just like and then they're just like locked in and so it's like man you know like it's like would you rather just like me slap you in the face before the game or do you just <laughs> want to give up a home run? You know, like what's, what do you want? Like, I'll, I'll slap, like, what do you need here? And so it's, I think there's like, there's some of that. And again, that's why the minor leagues are obviously great. You can try to figure some of that stuff out, but for like, for the, you know, for the younger listener here or somebody who's like trying to figure out what that looks like, um, you know, try to use the one to 10 scale and think about like, what do I, what am I like at my best? And I think that's a great, a great place to start is like, 
think back to those best performances you had, right? And like emotionally, physically, um, mentally, like where were you at? Like try to remember what that was like for you and, and try to identify some of the behaviors that you experienced, maybe some of the things you did prior to the game or the performance. And then you can sort of backwards plan off of that, which can be really helpful. Absolutely. Yeah. Figuring out your your best previous production and going from there. Yeah. Also, just on a very random side note, I used to be a professional wrestler, so I'm like big into having a big persona. So let's just get fired <laughs> up about that, baby. You know? <laughs> hey man, let the let everyone be who they want to be. As long as, you know, as long as you're being respectful and just but it's like I, I prefer people to be their authentic self, you know? Mm -hmm. That's that's how you get to be the best version of yourself. It's just be who you are, be real. Absolutely, hundred <clears throat> percent. Um, number six, short term memory. This is extremely important. Yeah, I mean, I I think that uh, you know, people get very hung up on the past. Um, and I mean, the fact of the matter is, you you can't change the past. You can't predict the future, but you can influence right here, right now. Mm -hmm. And so, the better you are at at you know, sort of slowing things down and and just having a short term memory about what happened. And and you you talked about it previously, right? Where it's like, okay, like your first at bat didn't go how you wanted it to be, but so like. Are you just you're just, you're gonna give up your second, third, and fourth at bat? That's what it's gonna be. That's how like that's how we're gonna look at it, right? Or like you struggled in your first inning, so like and, and you know trust I and mean, you'd be surprised at at the higher levels. Like players still struggle with this because they're they're so focused on the results, and um, it's a it's a very real thing. But when they get the reminder of just like hey, do you just not want to take your like third and fourth at bat? That's fine. If you like, or, or like my favorite is like, you know, they're like 0 for three. And then like, you know, they come up with a huge hit in the eighth inning. And it's like, all of a sudden they're just like, like, oh yeah. But it's like, yeah, man, but you like really dragged yourself for those, like those, those eight innings, right? Like you dragged yourself. And so how can we help those have a short-term memory? It's like really important. I, listen, some of the guys are great about it. Um, You know, some catchers are really good about it where like, when they, when like they use like the physical cue of their catcher's gear, like their, their, their gear getting put on their legs. Like when they tighten that up, they sort of feel that tightness and they're like, okay, like I'm, I'm, I'm flushing what happened from when I was hitting. And now I'm focused on, on just like my catching, right. My defense, some of the guys do it where it's like when they pick their gloves up in the, in the dugout after it, whatever, after they hit, it's like, that's the cue for them where they're like, all right, I'm switching. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to stop, you know, uh, thinking about my, my at bats, but but you can also look in the outfield and see guys who are just still thinking about their at bats when they're out there, you know? And so um, I, I think it, it's, it's finding different ways to flush it, like being really aware for yourself. And uh, like, it comes back to that honesty with yourself. If, if, if it's something that's just like, you're holding on to, how can you release it? How can you just like, you know, really just breathe it in and then just like breathe it out. And it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to breathe in the frustration, the anger. And when it's out, it's out and I'm done. And it's like, and it's a choice. And that's what I love. It's a choice. Like you have a choice to move on. And I think that's the part that people don't realize as much. All of these, like you genuinely have a choice about whether you want to hold on to this and you can waste your, like I said, your most precious resource and, uh, and commodity of your energy. You can waste it on that thing that you have no influence and control over, or you can flush it, take what you need to from it, take the feedback from it, figure out what you're going to do the next time you're up and then be present. And like, that's where your energy goes because that's what you can touch, manage, influence, and control is, is right here, right now. Do you give uh, your guys like any sort of time frame in between, let's say uh, a bat at bat, a strikeout, until they basically maybe go on defense is that do you do you let them sort of kind of sit in it for a little bit or you try to get them out of it as fast as possible is there any how do you approach that i mean i think it's individual you know it's like if like like i said if it's impacting if it's impacting your defense or if it's impacting your teammates your base running whatever if it's impacting some other facet of the game that's that's a problem right and like you need to be able to to, to let it go. Um, and you know, I mean, I, there's been lots of like, right. So it's like, Oh, like when I, you know, whatever, when the, when the last warm up pitch is pitched, like then I got to let it go or mm. when it's, you know, fill in the blank. So it's, it's, uh, I think for it's, it's individual choice, but again, it's like, there's part about like being a good teammate. Right. And like, like being like locked in and ready to go. 
but there's there's also again it's just like it comes back to our energy it's like you you can't be wasting it you can't waste a commodity and a resource like that one that's finite right it's not we don't have it forever like we don't have our energy you know it doesn't just like continuously fill up it's like be selfish like that's the part that i and like and i think like with deeper conversations with guys i'm like i'm like you need to be more selfish with your energy and right now you're kind of being an asshole with your energy if i'm being honest with you you know you're just you're just like letting it you're letting it eat you and you're just like not going to be able to use it for those next moments when you get up there and then that's like when the stuff starts to snowball you know yeah yeah so yeah creating an individual routine for yourself because mm-hmm. you know those things are going to happen in the baseball season like it's just yeah. inevitable just like in life shit's going to hit the fan things are going to go bad you're going to get into a slump like you're going to maybe get the yips you won't be able to find the strike zone the baseball will look like it's a little golf ball coming at you moving in 12 different directions right and so how do you continue going down that path like staying in a lane where you're showing up and uh yeah it's about like some some routines and thinking about your energy and all that stuff so yeah and having yeah. a short-term memory like ted lasso says <laughs> i love love it. yeah what a great movie yeah such a good show yeah great good, great show i can't wait for the next season it's supposed to come out i soon. know season three looks incredible i mean also just like the fact that he brought in a sports psychologist for the second season i was like let's go yeah normalizing I mean, it love exactly it. yes exactly like we were talking about before like yeah. it's about helping people become their best and that lady was doing a great job doing it so, uh, so good yeah <clears throat> all right we got two more number seven consistent checking of one's awareness i, I mean i kind of think it's like an underutilized thing just in general right is like we're we're oftentimes just like so focused again on the past on the future we're just like we don't take time to check in with ourselves and and a lot of times the cues are right there you know the like the tension we feel in our shoulders the tension we feel in our jaw the like irritability the uh the like flood or rumination of thoughts or the running of thoughts whatever it might be so a lot of cues right there about what's going on and we don't oftentimes tune into them. And so like, I think we're huge fans of just how consistently are you checking in on your awareness of what's going on? Um, you know, both for you, for others, but, but as we really think about ourselves, right. And it says one's awareness, but like, as, as we look at ourselves, it's how comfortable are you just like taking a pause? And, and again, like, like we talked a little bit about this um, before this show when we jumped on where I was like, you know, when you like step back and like, uh, this is like the parenting thing, but it's like when you step back and you, you like realize again, for me, it was like my, my kids like three and a half and one and a half. And you're like, they have no self-regulation and no self-control. My one and a half year old, like his brain is not even close to being developed. Like he has no clue what's going on. He can't talk. So he's like grunting or whining or crying, right? Like he wants something. And it's like, and, but, and yet I am very emotionally like frustrated, right? Or I'm angry and I'm tired. But like when you just take a pause and you like step back and you just sort of like have this awareness of what's going on, it's like unbelievable how there is a rapid change in your emotions. Rapid. Right. And it goes, like I said, like we're very aware of our emotions, but we know that our thoughts drive our emotions. Right. So when you take your time to have some awareness, you recognize that that emotion is not helpful, but you know that your thoughts are driving. And all of a sudden it's like, I had, I start thinking about my kids and how they're young and all those things that I just said, right. That they don't have self-reliance control that like he wants something, he needs something like why? Like, and I'm almost like, why am I acting like this? And all of a sudden my emotions change immediately from like anger and frustration to like slight shame and guilt probably to then like, like smile, happiness, love, like give them a hug, give them a kiss, like take a deep breath. Like this is like, you're going to miss this moment at some point, right? Like it, it's, it happens like that. And again, that happens over the course of what, like 10 seconds, five mm-hmm. seconds when you like really do it. So being able to just like check on yourself like that is so helpful or like, no, and I, we just, we don't do it. People don't like to be alone with their thoughts. They don't like to be like that aware, but it's, if I'm being honest with you, Aaron, it's like, it's, it's really freeing. Mm. It's, it's like, you don't feel trapped by yourself because you can talk to yourself and figure out what's going on because you're comfortable being in that space. You're comfortable being okay with like, yeah, like this feels, I don't like the way this feels. So I'm going to figure out what's going on and then figure out a way to, to make a change. 
how closely linked are awareness and honesty or being real with yourself? I'd say like very, very linked. Uh, yeah. I mean, like, you know, I mean, I'm on a podcast right now admitting that like, you know, my like one and a half year old, my three and a half year old, like, like drive me crazy sometimes, <laughs> you know, you know, but it's like, but I mean, I, I think, and again, everyone, it doesn't have to be with kids. It can be whatever experience where it's like, you like feel that thing. Like you feel like that, just like heat inside of you. And you're like, what the hell is that about? What is that? Why? Like, you know, and some people just like ride it out and they like, maybe they'll, you know, whatever their responses aren't what it need to be, but to be able to like stop in that moment and just like, and that's like, you know, you're doing it while you're breathing, just like take a deep breath and you're like, okay, like just relax. Like it's like, just relax. Like, let's work through this. Right. And it's like, that is linked with being aware of what's going on. And that's like being honest with yourself, being honest with your thoughts, being honest with your emotions, like recognizing sort of that chain reaction that happens, being okay that like it might not immediately feel better, being okay sitting in this odd space and being okay doing this like in the grocery store, which is what I did today. Like it was, it was in the grocery store and I was feeling all these things, right? It's like, but like you, 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 it's freeing. It's freeing when you know you like, and, and I think the reason it's freeing is because I don't think we have very much control in this world, I really don't. I don't think like there's tons of things that we have control over. But like when you find the things that you do have control over and you realize that like you do have control over a lot of the things that are happening to you personally, like internally, um, it gives you like this, this like incredible sense of freedom. Yeah. There's um another mental performance coach that I follow. I think his name is Zach Brandon. Oh uh, yeah, from the from the Diamondbacks. Yeah, he's awesome. Zach's great. And he says, um, he says, awareness, acceptance, action. It's basically what you just explained. Yeah, he said it way cleaner than I just did. But hey, whatever, man. That's good, <laughs> well, good, good teammates right there. I love that. You know, he put out three words on a social media post. You explained yeah. it deeply on a podcast. So I mean, it's perfect. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. No, it's uh, man. It's I just I do think it's exciting when you when you like when you get comfortable checking in with yourself. And again if you want to practice this, like do meditation, mindfulness, like this is how you do it. It's, it lets you get comfortable with your thoughts and like, and seeing them and, and experiencing them and letting them go without judgment. It's, it's a really cool practice to get into. hundred percent highly recommend it. Talk about it all the time on this pod. So hopefully yeah. my listeners have given it a try at this point. <clears throat> uh, last one, number eight, you briefly <laughs> mentioned some of this, but now we'll get into it an unwavering commitment to give my fucks to things in my control. I love that. All right. So, uh, I mean, so anyone who ha like the, the subtle art of not giving a fuck by Mark Manson, great book. Um, I mean, he's a little over the top on certain things, but the general concept, um, of this just idea that like, you know, every single day, man, you just, you have a limited number of F's to give you do. Okay. And so the way that I look at it is just it's like, I like, I think we should be hyper committed to giving our F's to things that are in our control, things that you can touch, manage, influence, and control. Like, can I influence this? Can I manage it? Can I touch it? Is there a sense of control in it? If the answer is yes, you get my energy. That thing gets my energy. That person gets my energy. That task gets my energy. That performance gets my energy. If the answer is no, for the most part, right? There's like some, I get, there's like certain situations, but for the most part, the answer is no, you don't get that. Like you don't get that precious resource and commodity. The answer is no. And again, it, this like, like, I'm telling you, like this will create a unbelievable sense of freedom. And it's like, as you and I, I like the other parts in his books too, because he like, he talks a lot about just like the way that we think and like how much we care about what other people think about us and like, and how much we, we think that other people think about us when in reality they don't because they're so busy thinking about themselves, right? It's just like, there's this constant wave of just like, what am I giving out? Like, what am I giving my energy to? What am I giving my fucks to? What, what, what? And, and to who, right? And it's like, man, when you like step back and you set some boundaries around that and you're like, this is my commitment that I'm going to do, it is, it is wildly freeing. It's, it's, it's incredible. It, it like, it helps you shape a lot of like, the, the things that you do, where you spend your time, the people you spend your time with, how much it helps you to audit your circle. I mean, my God, it's, it's incredible. Um, like what it does for you as a person. 
Uh, and it just helps with your development too. Cause it's like, it lets you focus on the things that matter the most and all the other stuff just like slides right off. Mm. But I think an important piece with that is circling all the way back to the first one of like, if you're not honest with yourself first, you don't know what you're going to say yes or no to. If you have mm -hmm. no sort of internal compass, you don't know your core values, you don't know who you want to be, you don't know what your starting point is, you don't know what friends you want to be surrounded by, you don't know what potentially support even looks like because you haven't been able, been able to be in that sort of environment, so you're unaware of that. And it's like all of that stuff is super important. And then when you have done sort of that like deep inner work, then you can be like, then it's like super freeing as you're saying to be like, no, I'm good. That doesn't, that doesn't align with me at all. And it's like yep. super easy for me to say no. Uh, thanks though. Appreciate the offer. <laughs> oh, this came in. Yes. In hundred percent. I want to do that. I would love to go, whatever, take this yoga class with you at nine o'clock on Saturday morning. That sounds lovely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you have to like, I mean, all of this is in steps, you know, but uh it gets yeah. the where it's the awareness part it's the being honest with your part it's the it's the part about like like also no you know i mean i'm 35 like i like i don't think i'm old but like i'm not young anymore but it's like you know you've like you you have some experience you have some life that like let you learn these things but there's like there's just a trail of failures behind me right now like and there's a trail of failures in front of me too but like that are bound to happen but like i am just steeped in failures and so it's like that's what's helped me understand a ton of this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and, and like the circle that I've created that's gotten smaller and smaller. And it's like, I, and, and, and you're right. It's like now, now I just think about this idea, like, like Justin Sue always said, he's like, just like, what, like he talks about like fountains and drains. And he's just like, what are the fountains in your life that just fill you up? Who are the fountains in your life that fill you up? And then there's like just the things and the people that are drains. And it's like, it, I, you know, I always say, I'm like, I'm like, I'm 35 with two kids and an amazing wife. Like, I don't have time for drains, dude. Like if you're draining me or you're draining my resources, or you're draining my time or my energy or my love or whatever, like, nope, you don't get my fucks. Sorry. See you later. And it's like, oh, but you're the fountain that's filling me up. Like you're damn right that I will wake up at seven o'clock and do this with you. Like you said, right. It's like, I want that. Cause that, that fills me up. That fills up that precious resource and commodity of my energy. Like I want to give you my Fs. That's what, that's what I want to do. Um, and like, that's like the fun and exciting part that like, I think, and again, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you're 15, 60, 35, whatever, like the, the more that you lean into that and you lean into some of that honesty and some of that tension, like that is where that magic happens. I'm telling you, like all the best stuff happens after you're afraid or you're scared or you're unsure or, or, or you, you, you the, the answer is, I don't know. And then you, you go and give it a try because you're either like, it's either going to fill you up or not fill you up, but at least you're learning something, you know, it's like all that magic always happens in that space. And that's the coolest part about it. Yeah. You got to go and get you some, you know, yep. <laughs> you have to like, yep. there's tons of stuff that we're all curious about and take a class, right. Uh, read a book about it, have a conversation with a friend about it. It may not, you know, nowadays, everything like that you're curious about, you have to turn it into a, like a six figure a side hustle with passive income and all this, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's like, no, you can just enjoy the thing that you enjoy. And it doesn't have to be anything other than something you do with your buddy, like once a month. Yep. Fucking sweet. That's sweet. Cause that is every time you do it, you're like, man, that, that revitalized me. Like yep. I have, like, I'm going to go have this like beautiful dinner with my wife and I'm going to get into some deep love. And like, just from that one little thing you did with your friend, because it's something that you actually enjoy. And, uh, yeah, we just have to make more time for that. Like have to, have to make more time for that. Yeah. Um, at least I think so. No, absolutely. Well, like fill your cup, man. It has to, it have to fill your cup and you have to hunt the good stuff. And you just like optimism, gratitude, the benefits, you just, you have to find ways to do it. So it's, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I was listening to you, Lauren and Justin on one of your podcasts. And I, I don't, I don't remember who said hunt the good stuff, but I think you guys ended that way. Mm -hmm. uh and I, I i've stolen that term just in case you're wondering <laughs> <laughs> so I, all right listen I, we'll be transparent here so i i i i didn't come up with hunt the good stuff i i got it from when i worked for the military we teach like a, there was a resilience course and hunt the good stuff and the research on it and stuff but i just it's uh it's just like the it's the best like the 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 more that you can find the good things hunt is a verb on purpose you're fighting the negativity bias but like doesn't have to be these huge things, but I'm telling you, man, the 
the more you seek out the good and you seek the silver lining and you identify those things every single day and have a little reflection on it. Um, man, it's optimism and gratitude are contagious and it's, it's freaking amazing what it can do for your life and for your people and, uh, and those around you. So yeah, man, I, I dig it. And, um, you know, again, I, I appreciate you watching the show and stuff too, but I, I just, I, uh, that's like, that was like our, like my favorite part. I'm like, I want to hear about the good stuff. Like, let's go. What's the good stuff going on? Cause it's contagious. Absolutely. Yeah. Made me feel good. And I was like, yep, yeah, hunt the good stuff. It's beautiful and magical. All right, Brian, I have one more question for you before I let you go. Yes, sir. <clears throat> and if you were going to pick, uh, put, excuse me, put up a billboard and millions of people were going to see that billboard every single day, what would you put on that billboard? Oh, I wish we could just talk about hunt the good stuff because I would potentially put hunt the good stuff on there because I think it's so good. But I, you know, I can, I can, I can peel back a little bit. Um, I would say, damn, dude, I wasn't really ready for this question. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, I think. I would say maybe. It's like one of those moments where I'm like, damn, I really am tired. My brain is jello, but uh, I think just like, it's it's not my, not my favorite, not my best, but I, I would probably just say be your authentic self would be what I put up there. Um, I just think, you know, like I said, man, we, we look at social media and we, we always look at other people or we look at these lives that people have and we want what they have. But I just think the idea of like, who you are and where you are, and where your feet are. It's like, there's a reason that you're in that place. And I, I know it can be really hard for some people to see that at times. I know that, like I said, the negativity bias makes us see all the bad stuff. But I think when people really start to like lean into who they are, like what that authentic self is um, and, and are like happy with it, they like, right. They're not focused on just like that. I need to improve this. I need to change this. Right. Like you talked about like the passive income or I need to hack this biology or hack this thing that you, like, they're just like, this is who I am. And like, and I love it. Right. doesn't mean you don't want to get better, but like, I just, I really want to be who I am at my best at my core. I just, I don't know, man. I, I think people need to be a little bit like, okay with that. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about high performance and I'm all about like the human potential, but I also think we need to like show ourselves a little compassion, a little love. And I think that you get that when you, when you, you know, you are your authentic self when you're out there. Absolutely. I think both things can exist and coexist beautifully. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate your, your time, your energy, your effort, your insight. So thank you. Right on. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it, man. See you guys next time. Cheers. What's up, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to that episode. If you enjoyed it, click here for another full-length episode of the podcast. And please, don't forget to subscribe. But most importantly, most importantly, please take good care of yourselves and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love.